Is NATO provoking Russia into a military conflict inside of Ukraine? Well, for decades, US and NATO forces have been surrounding Russia with military troops, weapons, bases, and conducting some of the world's largest military exercises. The US orchestrated a coup d'etat in Ukraine in 2014, which caused relations with Russia to become even more tense. The West accused Russia of forcibly annexing Crimea when its citizens overwhelmingly voted to become a part of Russia again. Today, Russia has deployed 90,000 troops near the border of Ukraine, but only on its own soil, which is in their complete right to do so. And now, Washington and NATO are claiming that this is part of a plan to invade Ukraine. And then in response, Ukraine has deployed over 125,000 troops to their border. On top of all of this, the Ukrainian president is telling the world that they have intelligence that Russia is planning to attack Ukraine within the first days of December of this year. But Russia has denied all of these claims. Отримали інформацію, що 1 числа в нашій державі буде державний переворот. Ну, цікава ж інформація. Мені здається, це важлива інформація. Let's keep in mind that approval ratings for the current Ukrainian president is very, very, very low. And it is common for political leaders to ramp up some kind of hysteria in order to deflect the blame of their failure of leadership in times of economic and political crisis, and especially during the COVID pandemic. Basically, it's easier to blame everything on Russia for Ukraine's internal affairs. But what is actually going on here? Welcome to the Global Network. Please support us by clicking the like button and subscribing to our social media accounts to stay up to date with our content. If you want to go further, consider joining our organization by visiting our website, spaceforpeace.org. The U.S. media industrial complex, which unapologetically supports any and all U.S. state interventions around the world, have been pushing the idea that Russia is up to something fishy by deploying 90,000 troops to its own border. The U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, has been a huge contributor to this hysteria. We're deeply concerned by evidence that Russia has made plans for significant aggressive moves against Ukraine. The plans include efforts to destabilize Ukraine from within, as well as large-scale military operations. Now, We've seen this playbook before, in 2014, when Russia last invaded Ukraine. Then, as now, they significantly increased combat forces near the border. Then, as now, they intensified disinformation to paint Ukraine as the aggressor to justify pre-planned military action. We are prepared to impose severe costs for further Russian aggression in Ukraine. NATO is prepared to reinforce its defenses on the eastern flank. The United States remains unwavering in our support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and committed to our security partnership with Ukraine. Even the NATO Secretary General has sounded warnings. We see a Russian military buildup, uh, we see uh, heavy armor, we see drones uh, and uh, combat ready troops, and we call on Russia to be transparent because this is uh, unprovoked, uh, unprovoked and unexplained. Uh, so, therefore, Russia needs to be transparent and uh, they need to reduce uh, tensions and uh, de-escalate. Let's take a look at all the forces involved in these dangerous tensions along the Ukraine-Russia border and let's try to understand the motive behind each player. The following is a chart published by a news outlet called The Saker, which has provided news and analysis about Russia and Ukraine politics for a long time. The first chart has three columns and three rows. Starting from the left, we have the entities involved, then in the middle we have each entity's objectives, and finally their goals. In the first row on the left, we have the combination of forces of the US, UK, the three Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, and then we have Poland. These forces have an objective to force Russia to openly intervene and a goal to recover total control of Europe. 
Next is the European Union, mainly Northern Europe, which has the same objective, but a different goal of deflecting blame from its own leaders and failures. We then have the Nazi regime in Kiev. Again, the same objective, but a different goal of cutting off the disloyal Eastern Ukraine and retaining political control of the rest of the country. This Nazi regime wants to blame everything on Russia in order to get rid of any disloyal Russian ethnic territories inside Ukraine. Any Russian intervention would allow the regime to declare a state of emergency and to attempt to destroy whatever opposition remains. With these first three primary actors, they all want Russia to intervene, but do not necessarily want an all-out war with Russia. They want to defeat Russia politically. Any Russian intervention will be used by the West in an attempt to justify NATO's existence, making a false argument that NATO is vital for European security. Also, the three Baltic states want to prove their utility to their Western masters. The LDNR, which is an acronym for the Independence of the People's Republics of Luhansk and Donetsk, has an objective to survive until Russia intervenes and a goal to integrate with Russia. Finally, Russia has the objective to prevent any escalation with the goal to partition Ukraine. The next chart looks at the outcomes of each actor and what they might want to avoid. The US, UK, three Baltic states, and Poland, as well as the EU, want to avoid an open war with Russia. This is a military conflict they wish to avoid, but why? It's unwinnable and potentially suicidal. The Nazi regime wants to avoid allowing the LDNR to survive without a Russian intervention because this is political suicide for the current Kiev regime. The LDNR, on the other hand, wants to avoid any breakthrough of Nazi forces on their lines because this would be a bloodbath. And Russia is trying to avoid any open war with the U.S. And they don't want to take control of much of Ukraine as it's not in their interest. This would cause too many economic difficulties. This third and final chart shows the tools each actor may use and its desired effect. The Western powers, including the EU, will certainly continue to provide weapons and public relations support and encourage the Nazi regime to escalate the tensions in the region. The ultimate US goal is continued chaos along Russia's borders. The Nazi regime will continue to escalate the tension, attempting to persuade Russia to intervene. The Russian ethnic LDNR just wants to survive and eventually integrate with Russia and Russia will try to delay any open intervention for as long as possible with the desired effect to integrate with only Eastern Ukraine, often called the Donbass region. Okay, so now, why has Russia deployed so many troops near their eastern border with Ukraine? Well, first, let's look at a map. Moscow, one of Russia's largest cities, is located less than 300 miles from the border with Ukraine. And Ukraine is essentially a de facto NATO-controlled territory, which has large military forces throughout the country right on Russia's doorstep. It should be a no-brainer that Russia would attempt to protect their own border and place an appropriate military force between the enemy and their capital city. With the three Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, NATO forces are currently based even closer, less than 100 miles driving distance to St. Petersburg. With the rhetoric from Washington, the Nazi regime in Ukraine and NATO forces escalating the tension through military exercises and public relations campaigns, why wouldn't any Russian want a defending force near their borders? This is common sense. But the Western powers continue to drive up this hysteria. Let's remember the end of the days of the Soviet Union where it was completely gutted and weakened. And since the 1990s, Russia has been slowly building up its forces just as the Western powers have slowly been encircling Russia for decades. Especially in the past seven years, 
These tensions have increased dramatically. There is another huge factor at play here, possibly the main contributing factor, that will explain the reasoning why the West is trying to provoke Russia and escalate tensions. Energy. Russia is attempting to provide Europe with energy sources such as gas and oil, and Russia is closer to Europe, has newer pipelines, and offers cheaper energy. The US wants to supply energy to Europe, but it is further away and costs a lot more. The battle between Russia and the US to supply energy to Europe is probably the main factor causing political and military tensions to increase. The Nord Stream pipelines 1 and 2 are the most recent pipelines to be constructed by Russia in order to supply Europe gas. These pipelines are owned by Gazprom, a multinational corporation, but majority owned by the Russian state. The company is the largest extractor of natural gas in the world and the largest company in Russia. And Europe is Gazprom's largest consumer. These pipelines completely avoid going through entire countries, bypassing territorial issues with NATO-controlled nations like Ukraine and Poland. The Nord Stream pipelines go through the Baltic Sea straight from Russia to Germany. Surprisingly, a US mainstream media outlet, CNBC, covered the issues surrounding this pipeline quite well. Let me show you the pipeline, or at least part of it, that everybody is talking about, including over the last few weeks. Nord Stream 2 is behind me. This is where this controversial energy project makes its first point of contact with land here in the north of Germany, in this coastal town of Lumen, which is about a three hour or so drive from Berlin. And the pipeline runs for 1,200 kilometers all the way from Russia through the Baltic Sea. And it is meant to provide 55 billion cubic meters of natural gas to Europe every year. Now, one of the big question marks is uh, what this pipeline will mean for the energy crisis that Europe is facing at the moment. Some uh, experts out there are concerned that this would be just a short term uh, solution. And in fact, Bank of America said in a note that if you were to fill 50 percent of the capacity of Nord Stream 2 between now and the end of the year, that would only help with about half of all of Europe's inventory shortfalls. So indeed, it could be a solution for the short term, but then in the medium and long term, there are questions as well about what sort of energy mix does the EU want going forward? And that is a big question that the heads of state will address next week in Brussels when they gather for a summit. Now, it's also important to look at the economic argument behind Nord Stream 2. And um, there's quite a lot of comparisons between this pipeline and the one that goes through Ukraine um, for obvious reasons. But experts say that this is a more efficient route. Vladimir Putin has mentioned that as well during uh, the panel with Hadley early this week, um, because it is a shorter route compared to the one that goes through Ukraine. It is more modern and therefore cheaper to maintain. And some calculations that I saw yesterday in a paper that uh, the European Parliament put together, if you were to refurbish or if you were to build a new pipeline via Ukraine, that would be a lot more expensive than what Nord Stream 2 has been. It is meant to have cost about, about 10 billion euros, I should say. Um, so indeed, when it comes to the economic argument, it makes sense to have Nord Stream 2. But of course, we cannot forget about the geopolitics. There's a lot of controversy there. And when it comes to this actual pipeline, we're still waiting for regulatory approval from Germany before this uh, gas pipeline can actually start providing natural gas to Europe, Juliana. Now, in another post by the Saker said, the energy sector is deeply concerned with Biden's green rhetoric, combined with the fact that OPEC plus countries are not obeying U.S. demands about prices. Also, U.S. shell gas is expensive. Should a war happen between Russia and the Ukraine, it would also certainly completely derail Russian energy exports to the EU, which in turn would create a very high demand for U.S. energy in Europe and worldwide. This is an old U.S. goal in Europe 
to force the EU to purchase US energy even though Russia can provide it for a much better price. With these tensions becoming a huge cause of concern in Eastern Europe, the US can continue to support the military industrial complex as well as provide military uses to the region. And NATO can justify its existence, the Nazi regime in Ukraine can continue to build up its forces, and the energy sector, mainly US oil corporations, can continue to dominate the European market. None of this serves the interests of the ordinary people of Europe, Russia, the US, and even the rest of the world. In addition, due to the current climate crisis and the melting of the Arctic ice, Western fossil fuel corporations want to drill baby drill in this vast region. But Russia has the largest land border with the Arctic Sea. The Rand Corporation has created a study calling for the balkanization or the breakup of Russia into smaller nations, thus making it easier for Western capitalists to take control. The melting of the Arctic is also a major point of contention for these powers in the region. With all these tensions increasing by the day, we have to ask about nuclear weapons. Now, the US and NATO are considering the deployment of nuclear warheads in Poland, while Russia is considering placing nuclear weapons in Belarus in retaliation. Они перевезут Польшу. Они перевезут в восточнее, но понятно куда, в Польшу. Да, тогда я предложу Путину вернуть ядерное оружие в Беларусь. How far will these powers go to dominate the energy market in Europe? What length will they go to dominate the opening of the Arctic? This is the Global Network. Thank you for watching. Please share the video. See you next time. And remember, get organized.